Hi and welcome back to the Business Career College video series. In this particular video we're going to look at the taxation of a what we call prescribed debt obligation. Now this is really not relevant for those going through the LLQP program. It's somewhat useful if you're going through a securities uh, exam prep, if you're preparing to write a mutual funds or your securities course um, exams. It's definitely needed for those uh, getting ready for the Certified Financial Planner series of exams. So the first thing we'll look at very briefly here are some examples of prescribed debt obligations so we know what we're looking at. This is going to apply to an ordinary GIC, not an index linked or market linked GIC, just an ordinary GIC that's paying compounding interest at a guaranteed rate, or this would apply to a strip bond, or this would apply to a money market instrument. Now the short maturity of money market instruments makes them a little bit difficult, but fundamentally they're going to work this way. So these three instruments are all going to pay, are all going to have um, all of their returns taxed as interest income. I will show you that in a small number of cases it's still possible to have a capital gain or capital loss here. I'll show you this specifically with respect to a strip bond. And the other important thing here is that for a person, in general, these are going to be taxed on an annual accrual basis. And I'll show you what that means in a minute, but basically an annual accrual basis means we're paying tax as of the anniversary date of when the investment was started or first acquired. This is different for a corporation. A corporation has to report this on the cash basis, which means it's reported when the amount is accrued, not necessarily when it's actually paid. So a corporation has these sort of awkward calculations when they use one of these instruments where you have to calculate the interest payable over a portion of a year, unlike a person who's only concerned about even year ends. So let's say that we have um, Jim here, and Jim acquires a strip bond. And he acquires it newly. So you'll recall that a strip bond is going to be acquired at a discount. Let's say Jim pays $850 and his strip bond is going to have five years to maturity and when it matures it will mature at its par value of $1,000. Okay, a fairly straightforward instrument. So what's going to happen here is the $150 of returns that Jim has, this is all going to be taxed as interest income. So everything that's sort of scheduled along the way here is going to be taxable as interest income. Okay. So now in order to calculate Jim's tax bill year over year we can do a little bit of financial calculator work here and we can say look Jim's in this thing for five years he has a PV of $850 or negative $850 to be perfectly accurate an FV of $1,000. Now with strip bonds we can do one PYR or two PYR. Let's say for the sake of argument here that we're going to do uh, two PYR just so that we know what we're working with. And now we can solve for his interest rate. So we've drawn our line already. Those that have done a financial uh, planning course with me are very familiar with this. Draw a line and now we're going to write out all of our values here. Okay. 
and we can see then two PYR over five years and the IYR on this thing is what we're going to solve for. Uh, PV is going to be negative 850 payment. There is no regular recurring payment here. Future value of a thousand and we'll solve on the default end setting. And we can see here that Jim's IYR is going to be 3.28. So he's effectively getting a 3.28% rate of return. Now, let's say that, and don't clear your calculator or anything yet, let's say that we want to know then how much interest Jim has in, let's say, year four. Well, actually, this is a very easy calculation to do with the financial calculator. All I'm going to do here is I'm going to say, okay, what's the future value at year four? So I'm going to resolve here. I'm only going to resolve for future value. I'm going to ask the calculator what that future value is, and then I'm going to do the same thing for year three. And the difference between those two amounts tells me how much interest income, oh, I'm sorry, that tells me how much interest income Jim earned in year three. I messed that up. Let's fix that. So we will solve for interest income in, oh no, that's year, year four. Sorry, I had that right. That's going to tell me how much interest income he earned from the end of year three to the end of year four or the interest income in year four. Okay, I shouldn't doubt myself like that. So it's real simple. Just re-input your times PYR, make that into a four, and then re-input your times PYR again, make that into a three, solving for future value at each step along the way. So we'll solve for that first future value and we'll get $968.02. Let's write it down here so it's a little clearer, 968.02. And then we're going to solve the same thing for year three, which will be $937.06. Again, I'll write it down here so it's perfectly clear. And the difference between those two amounts is the answer to this question, how much interest is there in year four? So we can see then this is $30.96, which is a fairly easy way actually to solve what could otherwise be a very complex problem. Now, there's a second type of problem here that's also quite complex with respect to these prescribed debt obligations. And this problem arises when we have Jim. So let's say, uh, just for the sake of argument, that at the end of year three, Jim sells this thing and he sells it for a price other than the price that he, for lack of a better term, should sell it at. Let's say that interest rates have gone down since he sold or since he originally acquired this thing. We know when interest rates fall, then our prices will rise. So if he sells this thing for, let's say, $950 at the end of year three, he should have sold it for 93706 So what's going to happen here is he will have paid tax. It'll be interest income on the gains associated with the interest income. So basically, if we follow this pink line over here, back to the left side of the screen, if we follow this pink line over here, that represents what would be roughly equivalent to Jim's ACB for this thing. So if I can go to year three here, if this is year three, we can see that the proper price here should be this 93706. But he actually is able to sell it for a little more than that. He's able to sell it for $950. And because he's able to sell it for more than what his ACB is, we take 950 minus 93706, 
And we can see then that Jim would have $12.94 in terms of a capital gain. And in the meantime, his interest income along the way, the total amount of interest income, we see already what it is here for the year between year three and year four. However, his total interest income, if we can look at it this way, would be the 937.06 that he bought this thing for minus the original $850 over the three years that he's owned this thing. He's paid $87.06 of interest income. Now that wouldn't be all at the time he sells it. This would have been spread over that three years that he owned it. I hope that helps. It's a fairly complicated set of ideas. And you can see, I guess one more thing I should point out here then, if he sold it for less than 937.06, he would have a capital loss. I hope that does help. Um, this is something that can show up on the exams and it is good absolutely to understand how all of this taxation works. I hope you enjoy your study.